Hi everyone, this is Barb Bruno. I want to welcome you to this week's uh, Top Producer Tutor Premier Coaching Club training webinar. This is an owner-manager call, but obviously the topic of metrics affects everybody that's in our profession. If you are not tracking metrics, you have no way to measure your current success or problem areas of growth. You know, I'm asked all the time, you know, why do I keep numbers? Why should I keep numbers? This is the only way to really know what each person needs to do every single day. I know when I was working a desk and I first went into this profession, I didn't necessarily track my numbers. And it wasn't until I realized, wait a minute, there's a process here. If I know my send out to placement ratio, I know how many send outs I have to book before I'm going to get a sale, before I'm going to get a close. And when I started just monitoring that one number as a recruiter, it took me from average production into big billing because I knew where to put my focus. What you don't measure doesn't count. So tracking metrics, what it does is take the emotion out of critical daily decisions of what you need to focus on every single day. Now today I'm going to discuss several topics in the area of metrics. Number one, who should track metrics? What metrics should you actually track? You know, when should metrics be kept? Where should you track them? And why tracking metrics will help your company prosper and grow? And I can tell you, as an individual producer, there were two things that changed my life. When I first went into this profession, I was not that successful. In fact, I was pretty much a failure because I was working extremely hard, but I was not focused on the people I could place in jobs. <clears throat> and unfortunately, hard work does not guarantee success in our profession, does it? There were two things that changed my life. Number one, I realized I had to plan every single evening before I left work. I had to know what calls I was making the next day so that my outgoing calls controlled my destiny and not the incoming calls. And who calls us the most? It's the people we're never going to help in jobs. And then the second thing was I learned that I had to keep my numbers. What's interesting about metrics is that in any other profession, if you know somebody who sells cars or sells insurance or sells software, you know, you go to anybody that's even in retail sales, they know their numbers. But it always amazes me when I'm in front of an audience of recruiters or managers and owners, and I ask for individual stats and ratios, and everybody kind of looks at everybody. And when I really ask, okay, how many people in this room track their stats daily, it's a, it's a great you know, minority of people in the audience that actually track their numbers. And I want you to think about this a minute. I don't think any of you wake up in the morning and go, wow, I can't wait to be average today. I'm really excited. This is going to be a great day. Sun is shining and I'm going to go to work and I'm going to be average. I don't think any of us would want to be described as average, but over 90% of the people that work in the staffing and recruiting profession are average by today's standards. A top producer, a big biller right now, is anybody that is at consistently at the 350 to 400,000 rate in either direct placement or 350 to 400,000 in gross margin of profit. And so when you look at your numbers right now, you may feel you're doing great, but by today's standards, you know, fees have increased, margins have increased, salaries have increased, pay rates have increased, and as a result, you don't have to make as many sales as you did two years ago to produce the same amount of sales and production. But to be a big biller, you know, in, in our profession, that three fifty to 400000 is sort of the benchmark now of what a big biller is. So hopefully today's program is going to help you make that change, make you flip that switch inside of you to realize that, yes, it is a pain in the neck. And I am no different than you are. I do not like details. You know, I would rather stick a pin in my eye than have to write something down or to track a report or to write down a stat. But I learned a long time ago that unless I know the numbers, I'm, I'm going to really limit my success. And so I'm not saying that tracking metrics is fun. I'm not saying that it's something that you're going to really love and enjoy. But when you start getting different results, you're going to realize that this is the reason. Wouldn't it be great to arrive at work today? and know exactly what results you need today to surpass your goals this month. You know, what's nice about this call is we're making it very early in the month of July. So we're at the very beginning of the month. And wouldn't it be nice if you could predict today that if you did certain things every single day this month, that at the end of the month you know, you absolutely know without any doubt that you're going to hit or surpass the goals that you set. And those of you that are only doing direct placement, you know, you might sit there thinking, you know, Barb doesn't know what she's talking about. There's no reoccurring revenue. Every month is a crapshoot. Every month is a crapshoot unless you track your stats. 
So who should track metrics? Who should track their stats? That answer is extremely easy. It's every single individual that is involved in the staffing and recruiting profession, the placement process, whether focused on recruiting or client development and sales, should track metrics. So basically everybody working in our professions. Owners and managers should track their metrics in addition to holding everybody they manage accountable to keep daily stats and metrics. You know, and I've learned as an owner that the individuals that work for me are going to track what I inspect versus what I expect. If I tell my recruiters, you know, I expect you to keep your stats, I expect you to know your metrics, you know, I really want to do that, and I never ask them for them. Like, I never ask them what their numbers were at the end of every day. I never ask them for their ratios. They're going to stop doing it because, you know, unless I put some importance on this, and owners and managers listening to me today, if your team is not tracking their metrics and not tracking their stats, some of that responsibility has to be put on your back because you are the person that needs to show them what's in it for them in order to get somebody to embrace the idea of writing down stats every day. You've got to request metrics, you've got to react to the metrics, and you, you have to utilize metrics during your discussions with members of your team because if you don't, they're not going to keep them. Staffing and recruiting is a sales profession and sales is a numbers game. Sales measurements should focus on practice and improvement rather than the winner. You know, a strong sales organization is built around measuring for success. It's not always about the one person in the office that is, you know, doing three times more than everybody else in the office. It's looking at what, where you are, what you're doing currently, and what can you do, what can be measured to make you more successful. You know, there are some people that, you know, I've had beginners, I've had rookies, you know, place more than my senior people their first year out. They just have that natural ability. They have that natural, you know, drive and determination, and, and they're just not phased by rejection, and they go out there, and they're a superstar. You know, and some of my senior people would go like, you know, I can't believe that rookie. It's just beginner's luck. No, what is that beginner doing? You know, as an owner or manager, I always study the most successful people in my organization and try to figure out what are the functions they're doing that are, that are basically providing the highest level of results. What are their numbers? What are their numbers when they first start for me? What are their numbers a year later? Because, see, your newer people are going to have much higher numbers much higher numbers because they don't know who to call and they don't know how to call. As you get good at this, you know, your send out to placement ratio might be an eight to one. You have to send eight people out in a first interview before you make a placement. And a year later, it might be six to one. And when you're really good at the job, you know, and you really have fine tuned, you know, your, your send out to placement ratio could be three to one. It just depends on a person's individual ability. It can't be by years of experience you know, or judging them against that winner, that top producer in your office, because the skill sets could be very different. So let's talk about, you know, reason number one on, on who should track, track metrics. There's small differences in perspectives that can really make a big difference in results. The phrase measurement of success should be always focused on the current results because it speaks to the process of continuous improvement and the new level for production and income that is always possible. I don't care what you're producing right now. I don't care what you've produced from January 1 to today's date. As far as I'm concerned, that's past history. It's what change are you going to make? You know, what change can you make starting today that's going to make you have a record third and fourth quarter? And, and as I told you at the very beginning, I was not, I hear a lot of speakers out there and they say, when I, my first year I did a million dollars in sales. You know, I kind of stand back and I always want to say, well, show me your W-2 or show me your earning statement because I find that hard to believe that somebody that's never done this at the first year, they're this rock star. You know, I was not. I was a failure at first. And it wasn't until I embraced the importance of planning and metrics, that's when I became a big biller. And I think those of you that are sitting out there now and thinking, wow, I, I'm, I'm definitely average by the standards of today, or I might even be below average. Or maybe you're an owner-manager sitting there going, wow, I've got an office full of people that are average. That's okay. That's a nice, strong foundation. Now realize how you can take it from where you are. It's always looking at where you currently are and what changes do you have to make, what improvement do you have to make, where you can really improve production, income, and sales. You know, you can't do things the same way and expect different results. 
every time you attend one of my calls, my biggest challenge to all of you, this is why I do these live calls weekly for my clients. The reason I do these live calls weekly is I want to be that voice in your ear that is continually motivating you, continually encouraging you, continually giving you changes that you can implement that make a difference in the way you work your desk and how much you're earning. I only became a trainer so you could be more successful. Reason number two, in measuring for success, it recognizes that improvement comes from making adjustments and then measuring results to test the adjustments. What happens if you embrace an idea today and so you decide to make a change and you make the change but you're not getting results? What you have to do is always focus on enhancing performance. Don't criticize your current level of performance. You've got to work together to achieve higher results. Owners and managers, if you go up to somebody and just say, you know, your production is subpar, you know, you're really not making it, this isn't working, that isn't working, you know, I'm sure that person knows, they know, they know that they're not successful, but it's looking at what they're currently doing and giving them some very specific things they can change, very specific things that they should focus on. You know, most recruiters don't even realize, and, and I don't care whether you're in the recruiting side of the sale or client development, your job every single day is to book send outs, to get people in front of hiring authorities. My definition of a send out is a human being in front of a decision maker, first interview. Every single day you should be getting more people out on first interviews. That is the most important stat to keep. That's the most important number. If you want to be more successful in July than you were in June, book more send outs. And the number you have to know is your send out to placement ratio. That is the most important number or your send out to fill if you're working contract or temp. Reason number three to measure for success is measuring for success is a phrase that moves the focus of measuring to what is possible. I think too often after a while you just accept the fact that well this is I'm an average producer or I'm making more money than I ever met made. I'm kind of comfortable. You know, if I produce more, maybe maybe I'm going to be expected to produce more. But what you have to realize is the price that you're paying and the price that your business is paying and the price that people that you love pay when you get comfortable. You know, measuring for success is simply about finding methods of measuring a series of activities throughout the placement and fill process. Then you make adjustments along the way to achieve the desired results that you want. Once you know the stats and ratios of everyone on your sales team, you will eliminate slumps once and for all. It truly takes the mystery out of where everybody needs to focus. And wouldn't it be great if everybody in your office, including you, now knows the exact results they must achieve each day to attain their goals? It's not about the numbers of calls they make, but rather the results they achieve. Now, every time I say that, when I'm on the podium, I just I just spoke at the uh, California conference in Las Vegas, and I know the minute I say that, it's not about the numbers of calls, but the results they achieve. And I have owners and managers just roll their eyes like, no, we want people on the phones talking to people. Of course you do. But what you really want are results every day. If somebody's on the phone making 50 phone calls because they're told they have to make 50 phone calls and they're leaving voicemails and they're not really doing sales presentations, what good does it do for you to go up to them and say, make more calls? If somebody is not producing, you know, it used to be in the past that as owners and managers, what we would say is make more phone calls. But think about that. If somebody's made 50 phone calls with no results and they make 50 of the same phone calls, they're still going to get no results. It's not the number of calls. It's the call they're making. You know, you, you, it's, it's so interesting that now we can really find to the way we own a business, manage a business, and it's wonderful to teach our people. It, it's, it's really empowering for everybody that works for you to know exactly what results they need every day. You can grow and actually succeed without measuring, but without systems and structure in place, your management team does not understand how or what to manage. And this can become deadly when the job market or the economy takes a turn. Right now, we are in a very healthy market. This candidate-driven market is wonderful. And it's so funny because I had some recruiters come up to me in Las Vegas and say, it's so hard to find people. It's so hard to find people. This is ridiculous. And I said, do you realize that's good for you? Because if it was easy to find them, nobody would need you. You know, when there's a lack of top talent, that's the best market you can be in. We are all in the best profession on the face of the earth in the best time in history. And that's why now it is more important than ever before to track metrics because metrics also show you if you're working the wrong orders. 
if you're working the wrong contracts or wrong temp assignments, if you're putting your time on candidates that are a big fat waste of your time. You all place 5% of the people that come to you. And that's the statistic worldwide. We place 5% of the people that our businesses attract. And how much time do the other 95% take away from your day? You know, you really have to focus. And the numbers help you see this. You know, you, you, can, you can say, well, I don't know that I believe you, Barbara. You don't have to believe me. Once you track your metrics, you're going to be amazed at how much information you get. So let's talk about what metrics you should track. You've got to basically measure activities, you know, in the whole sales process. Because what it does is when you measure activities, okay, in your sales process, it helps provide feedback to you to set standards for activities that lead to the desired sales results. My team loves that they all know exactly what they have to do every day to always hit their goals. It also helps you measure activities at different parts of the sales process. For instance, if I'm, if I'm not booking enough sendouts, I'm not getting enough people in front of my clients, you know, I'm not, I'm not setting up interviews, then I have to back that into, okay, how many presentations did I make to those candidates? Once I got a good candidate in, how many jobs did I present to them? You know, or I can go all the way back to my recruiting presentation. Okay, how many recruiting presentations did I have to make before I booked an interview? How many interviews did I do before I actually presented, you know, opportunities to that person so it's a good candidate? And then how many presentations did I make before I booked an interview? And then lastly, the send out to placement. How many people were sent out, were interviewed before I made a placement? You can track it back to the very beginning and then you know exactly what you have to do. We have a minimum standard in my office that nobody that's on the recruiting side of the sale interviews less than three people a day. Three people a day is just the minimum standard here. And that's three new people that are interviewed every day by our recruiting team and they're put into the database. Some of our newer people interview many more than that. They're only working the recruiting side of the sale. They're new. And so, you know, their minimum standards are a little bit higher. And so let me give you an example. If you know you have to do three interviews a day, and let's back this out into exact numbers. Say that I have a send out to placement ratio of five to one. I have to send out five people in order for, my, for me to make a placement. And I know that. I also have learned by looking at my numbers that I have to interview three people a day I have to interview three people before one of them is going to be sent out. So if I have to book five send outs in a week, I know I have to interview a minimum of three people a day because that means one of those people every day is going to result in a send out. That gives me my five send outs for the week. And if I have a five to one ratio, that would give me a placement a month or a placement a week or a fill a week. You know, so you have to know how many sales you need to make and you back it up. Now, if I have to do three interviews a day, okay, I know that's my number. And say that today is Wednesday and on Monday I did three interviews and on Tuesday I only did two interviews. Today I have to do four. Because if I don't hit that 15 interviews this week, I'm going to book four sendouts and now I'm not going to make a sales sale this week. This is how important it is to know your numbers. And one more thing, if I'm supposed to do three interviews a day, I, you know, and my people know that that's a minimum standard, I never tell them make 50 recruiting calls or make 75 recruiting calls. What I say to my team that has to do this is, you know how many interviews you have to do a day, make as many recruiting calls, reach out to as many people where you are going to book four or five interviews a day. Now, remember, the standard for this particular day is three interviews. But I told them I want you to book four to five interviews. And why do you think that's the case? It's because somebody's going to no show. Somebody is going to be, you know, maybe you didn't get a resume in advance and somebody is just not worth your time. And you realize it in the first few minutes of the conversation. You know, and so if you need to do three interviews a day, you have to book four or five. And what would be the worst possible scenario that happened? Maybe all five show up. And now you're ahead of the game this week. And you might even make more placements. You might throw in one extra placement this month. It is so easy once you realize the power of the numbers. It's easy to understand how this will impact your level of success. And then you make adjustments to the activity area that needs improvement. What if you're doing interviews and you realize that, wow, I'm doing five or six interviews. I might do ten interviews before I send some if I can finally send somebody out in an interview before that person ends up as a send out for me. If you're doing 10 interviews before you book a send out, then you have to look at the quality of people you're interviewing. You know, what about the sources you're using to recruit your candidates? You know, and you really have to look back at the quality that you're surfacing. 
And so it really does help you make adjustments to the areas that need improvement when you're tracking your numbers. And also you can measure against the new results and then the process is repeated. Once you start looking at your numbers, then you're going to realize, okay, maybe I've got to make more recruiting calls. Maybe I really have to screen more on the phone. I've got to be asking better questions. I've really got to focus on the 5% that I know I'm going to place. If people don't have skills, stability, and experience, I'm going to go next. Because you know what? Nobody pays us a lot of money, you know, for all the hours we work. We're paid on results. You know, some of you have a base salary, which is wonderful. You know, some of you are working draw against commission where you have no guaranteed income. You know, and, and for all of you, you want to put your focus on the people that you know are going to result in you making a sale. It makes me sad. There was one girl in California that called me aside, and I sat there with her for almost 45 minutes trying to help her, and she was in tears. And she said that the conference was her owner's you know, basically last investment in her, that if the conference didn't turn her around and if she didn't go back and, and really, you know, provide better results, she knew she was going to be fired. And owners and managers, you know, you're in business for one reason and one reason only. That's to, you know, basically generate profits, not provide jobs for the people that work for you. But it's nice when the people know their stats and ratios, then nobody has to worry about their job because they know what they have to do every day. There are certain ratios and stats that are critical to measure in order to determine the exact results needed each day by the individuals on your sales team. Now I know I have, you know, I have hundreds of people on this call. All of your business models are different. Some of you just do contracts. Some of you do contract to contract to hire. Some of you do, you know, um, direct placement and you do temp to hire. You know, some of you do retain search. I know all of your business models are different. But there are certain numbers, there are certain numbers that are key ratios no matter what segment of the profession you're in. And the ratios are, include the following. Your recruiting call to hit, however you're surfacing your candidate to finally somebody says, yes, I want you to represent me. And then once, once somebody says, yes, they send you a resume, how many resumes do you get or how many conversations do you have till finally you're interviewing somebody? How many interviews do you book to a send out or interviews to a submittal if you're doing contract or temp? And some of you that are doing like light industrial temp, how many interviews do you do before somebody shows up on, you know, there might be no interviewing process or submittal. They might just want you to have people show on on a job, but you have to know that. You've got to know how many people you interview and, until you either get an interview, you submit a candidate if you're doing contract or temp, or sometimes in light industrial, how many people do you interview before you're sent out on assignment? Then you've got to know your send out to placement or fill ratio. That is the most important number to track. In fact, I would give you all a challenge. I want you to write this down on the handout. What I would challenge all of you to do is I want you to go back to January 1 of this year, and I want you to look at how many candidates you sent out on interviews or how many, can, how many submittals you had. Those of you that are working with VMS situations where you've got a vendor management situation on premise, I had a woman at the California conference admit to me that she is sending over 50 resumes to this VMS she's working with before she even gets a submittal. I mean, I'm, I'm not even talking a placement. Before she gets an interview, over 50 resumes to get one interview. I would really, you know, stop and think about that. Are you really tracking the numbers? What is a waste of your time and what is not a waste of your time? You've got to put your time where you have the best chance of results. And when you're looking where you're making, when you go back and you track your send out to placement or fill ratio, okay, also look at the titles that you placed. Look at the kinds of positions that you're filling. Because those of you that are on the client development side of the sale, you want to repeat the business that you've been filling since the beginning of the year. You know, we write so many orders, and right now the ratio is very high on the number of job order to fill or temp assignment or contract to fill. Because we're writing business we shouldn't be writing. You're writing any and every piece of business out there where, in essence, you should know what your best business is. Where do you make fills and placements and try to repeat that same business because you've got candidates in your database. You've also got to know the marketing call, the job order, contract, or temp assignment. How many sales calls do you make? How many marketing presentations before you write an order, contract, or temp assignment? How many presentations do you make until you finally book an interview? And how many job orders, contracts, or temp assignments do you write before you fill one? I never, ever worry about the job orders or contracts or temp assignments we fill. What worries me, and it should worry you, and owners and managers think about this, you know, go back to January 1 and just take a number. Find out how many orders or contracts or temp assignments your company wrote, and then how many did you fill. And when you look at the difference between what you wrote and what you filled, all the orders you didn't fill 
often they're a big fat waste of your time and think of the money that was left on the table and too often the reason that orders and contracts and assignments aren't filled is because we're all over the place we're not focused we haven't figured out our best business our client development people are bringing in orders that are not even what we do you know as an owner or manager you've got to give directives to your individuals on this is our best business go after these orders because we know that's who we are that's what we can do you know there's riches and niches there's riches in narrowing what you do what never changes in the staffing and recruiting profession even though things change almost on a daily basis is the importance of how to discover what is critical to measure as it relates to activities and sales results see discovering what is critical to measure is mostly a function of common sense observation and trial and error you know measuring each individual send out to fill replacement ratio is the best way to predict production and income I can tell you when I had multiple offices the only thing my managers called into me every day was were the send out numbers and again a send out for me is a candidate in front of a client first interview I could predict what my offices were going to do just by knowing the send out totals because I knew the send out to placement ratios for each office you know and again if you want to be more successful in these last two quarters than you were in the first two quarters get more people in front of hiring authorities and it's always been my I'm not doing a training session on screening candidates right now but you know too often your recruiters think they know who the clients are going to hire you know and my theory is when in doubt send them out if they've got the skills stability and experience do a rock star prep and get them out there and you'd be amazed at how many people will get jobs that you didn't think would get hired you don't you know your recruiters don't have to like somebody that they place at a job the client has to like them most recruiters are not detail oriented I'm sure this is not surprising anybody listening to, to my voice I'm not detail oriented and I don't know many owners and managers that are detail oriented in our profession if you're a pure salesperson but measuring stats should contribute to sales and not distract from sales you know you can't have people you know doing things that's so difficult that they that it's just taking their time and they stop doing it you need to keep measuring simple and as automatic as possible you know just eliminating slumps forever and having your entire team consistently attain their goals should be motivation enough you know for you to want to do this and imagine that just imagine for a minute no slumps and everybody on your team is attaining their goals wouldn't that be great you know and, and for those of you that have some people that are on the fence or not doing that well watch what your senior people are doing don't look at the numbers of calls but where are they focusing their efforts you know we have to know where they're focusing their efforts because that helps you predict you know what people are going to do now let's talk about the next topic is when should metrics be kept you know this is not something that you can do one day and not the next or do one week and not the next you know tracking metrics are as important as planning and must be tracked daily in order for them to be accurate the sooner tracking metrics becomes a daily activity the sooner you and your team will enjoy consistent production and and understand something your team has to track metrics for 21 consecutive days before it becomes a habit and last year I went to a nutritionist this is kind of a silly example to give you but I'm gonna give it to you anyway I went to a nutritionist um, to discuss some things and this woman said I notice you wear your watch on your left wrist and I said yes I do and she said your watch should never be on your on the side of your body is your heart it's not good for you to wear your watch on your left wrist and I said but I'm right-handed I've always worn my watch on my left wrist and she said I really would prefer if you would change it and put it on your right your right you know, wrist and I went okay and I can tell you I can't tell you how many times I got to work and realize I put my watch on my left hand hand a wrist so what I finally did is I put a rubber band around my left wrist so in the morning when I would go to you know put my watch on the left hand wrist the bright yellow rubber band would remind me okay you're supposed to put your watch on your right hand side now I don't even think about it now I put my watch on my right hand wrist I don't think about it it's my new habit kind of a silly example but it takes 21 days of repetition to have for anything to become a new habit the reason that most things fall through the cracks it, you know and I'm an owner I'm a manager I try to implement something and I get everybody excited and then I stop monitoring it because I'm thinking well they know I taught them you know they see the benefit in this and by the way you always have to show another person the benefit to them metrics benefits everybody it benefits the owner or manager because you can predict what's going to happen it benefits the people that you supervise because they're not going to have that traumatic experience of roller coaster production 
Do you know some recruiters, I had someone in my last audience say, well, Barb, you know how you have two good months and then one bad month? And two good months and then one bad month? I said, so basically, you write like four months off? I go, how can you do that? Like, I don't get that. Like, every quarter, you write a month off? You know, that, that's kind of crazy that you're writing off four months out of the year. And I said, that's, you know, like 33% of your year you're writing off that it's going to be bad. And he goes, well, that's just how it is. It's not how it is. If, if you were keeping numbers, the other thing I want to say to all of you, the reason you have to keep metrics every single day, is if the market starts to turn, if a trend starts to take over in your niche, you can predict it. When, when you know, people got slammed in 2009 and 2010, our team knew that something was going on very, very early in 2009 and even in late 2008. You know why? The metrics were off. Our numbers all went up. We were making more presentations before we were getting results. And all of a sudden, everybody's ratios were increasing rather than decreasing. And when they decrease, that's when you know it's good. And all of a sudden, we saw ratios increasing. And I can tell you, in 2010, we were making five times as many client development calls to get the same results we were just a year you know, prior to that because we had to, because the market just tightened up. You know, but, but the reason a lot of businesses went under and, and got slammed by trends is because they weren't keeping numbers. And see, every so often in the staffing and recruiting profession, I've been in this profession over 25 years, and I could tell you, every so often there's a trend that comes up that you either turn with the trend or all of a sudden your competition is running right over you. Metrics and stats help you anticipate those trends, help you know when to just make little adjustments that are going to keep you and everybody that works for you competitive. So you've got to track your metrics daily. You can't, at the end of the week, try to remember what you did. It doesn't work. Now, where should you track your stats? Metrics should be tracked in any kind of format and location where you as an owner or manager can review them. I don't care where you track them, but they need to be tracked. Where you track them is not as important as the actual habit of everybody in your office realizing the importance of tracking stats and ratios. You know, we've done it many different ways in my organization. In fact, we're just now automating, you know, we're, we're trying to automate a, a, a ratio and stat, you know, a program in my office right now because I just want it easy. I want it to be icons. I want it to be easy. So I have my group, you know, trying, trying a program right now to see if it makes it easier on them because I want tracking stats to be easy. It's important also that everybody realizes the what's in it for me. If I work for you and you tell me I've got to keep more numbers, I'm going, really? You know, I can barely keep up with the job order flows. We've got so many temp assignments. I can barely breathe now. And now you want me to track my numbers? And again, if you don't make it simple, the process of tracking stats must be simple if I'm going to do it. But your reaction and review of the stats to a great extent will impact whether your team tracks them or not. And if they realize the what's in it for them. If you've got somebody that really wants to achieve something, and, you know, they're buying a new house, they're getting married, they're having a baby, they want a new car, they want to take a trip to Italy, whatever they want to do, and they realize that if they track their numbers, it's going to eliminate slumps forever, and they can buy that house or go on that trip. Believe me, they'll do it, but they have to see what's in it for them. Another piece of homework I want to give all of you that are listening to my voice right now, I want to ask you all right now to look around your desk, and can you look up right now and see the five goals remaining for 2014? Because if you can't, you're never going to have a record third and fourth quarter. At the beginning of the year, I had suggested that everybody write down 10 non-negotiable goals with five dated action items under each goal. And when you finish those action items, you achieve the goal. Half the year is gone. And what most people do is they write down goals in November or December, and they stick them in their desk drawer. And then next November or December, when the owner asks them for goals, they pull out the goals again and say, oh, those are pretty good. I'm going to put 2015 on that. The only time you commit to a goal and you'll, you'll pick up the phone when you don't want to or you'll do that plan when you don't want to or you'll track your stats is when you realize that helps you, you know, achieve your goals. And so if your team does not have their goals in front of them, then they're never going to be as motivated as they could be. You can't motivate another individual. If you have children, you know that statement is correct. You can't motivate someone that doesn't want to be motivated. The only thing that motivates an individual is, is what's going on in their life. You know, you've seen a lot of people that have gone through trauma or they've gone through a divorce, and all of a sudden they become this tremendous success. You know why? Because they had four kids to support. You know, it, it's just amazing what somebody can do when they realize what's in it for them. So my homework for all of you listening to my voice right now 
is after the July 4th holiday, I want you all to walk in with your five goals, owners, managers, anybody else on this line, and owners and managers, I want you to give this homework to your people. They're going to have some time off in the next few days. Ask them to write down the five goals they want to achieve by the end of the year, and you want four or five dated action items under each goal, and they're going to highlight the action items as they achieve them, and they're going to be posted where everybody can see them, and this is in all areas of their life. This is not just, I'm going to produce this much, I'm going to sell this much. If they could have the perfect third and fourth quarter of this year, what would it look like? What would they do? You know, and then what would that mean for them? They've got to tie the, the production and the sales into what it's going to mean for them and the people they love. The problem with people in our profession is most of us are social workers who like money. If we weren't a recruiter, we would be a social worker helping the human race. But we like money, and so we became a recruiter. But then too often that social worker comes out. And, and you know, I, I don't know any of you, but I'm not going to put an awning over anybody's desk that says nonprofit. Can't do it. As an owner, everybody that works for me has to be generating a profit. And so that's why, you know, if you start doing this and you show them what's in it for them, but the only way you're going to be able to achieve this right now is if you have them write down five goals in all areas of their life with five dated action items, you know, with a specific date that they're going to achieve them. And then once those five steps are done, then they've achieved the goal. If you don't do that, then goals are like New Year's resolutions, and we know what happens to them. So I would challenge all of you for you to do it as well as have everybody that works for you do this. Have goals, written goals with five action items posted so they can read them when they're on their phone. It'll, it'll, change, it'll change everybody's life. Now, why will tracking metrics help your company prosper and grow? Because the more profitable you are, the better it is for everybody that works for you. I have never met a manager. I have never met one manager in my entire career who didn't feel that their recruiters could produce more, their salespeople could do more. Of course they can. Everybody listening to my voice could produce more and could sell more. You know, but will they? Do they even know what you expect of them? Have they tied their daily results into their income goals? When a recruiter says to me, you know, I don't want to produce more because then they're going to expect that of me, that lets me know that that recruiter has not at all equated additional success to what it could do for them and the people they love and their family. They've not even thought about that. They're thinking, oh, the pressure, they want me to produce more, they want me to sell more, you know. And the problem is some of the people that work for us are making more money than they've ever made in their lives, and they don't see the need to make more. But then when you get them to dream bigger, I always say to my team, if you won the lottery and we put a couple million dollars in your checking account, what would you do with that? And then all of a sudden they start dreaming bigger, they start thinking bigger, they start raising their financial thermostat, and they think about all the things they could do. Well, guess what? They don't need to play the lottery. There's no limit on what they can do for you if they just start thinking bigger. But again, it has to be something that, that means something to them and the people that they love. They're not going to do it for you as the owner. I used to think that I'd get up every December and we're going to have a record year and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I would see some eyes rolling in my team and I'd go, what? And, and all they heard was what I was going to do to them, not for them. Tracking stats and individual ratios is something you're doing for your people, not to them. The statement, what gets measured, gets focused on, is true. You measure to understand, learn, grow, and succeed. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. You know, you measure for warning signs of slumps, but also to identify who is doing a great job. You know, and by measuring and setting minimum standards, you can identify methods for improvement. I love when I talk to managers and owners, and I say, what are your minimum standards? Well, you really can't implement minimum standards. Really? I didn't know that as a business owner. I think that most business owners set minimum standards. Without measuring stats and ratios, the ability to prosper and grow can appear to be intangible and complex and you just kind of throw your hands up. You know, and you can't afford to do this. And also, this can cause anxiety because you don't know the following things. You don't know how to determine production in the coming month, quarter, year. Uh, you don't know how to measure who is attaining the results to actually close placements. Um, you don't know what standard to use when you're hiring new members of your sales team. And you don't know how to set minimum result standards because you haven't measured anything. Measuring activities takes the guesswork out of managing production and salespeople by providing a standard focus on the critical elements of the sales process. Now, other benefits of measuring include, obviously, the opportunity for positive feedback on solid activity levels. 
and clues to where your coaching would be most beneficial. Role playing and coaching is the best way to mentor somebody to a higher level of production. It also allows you to work with your people by focusing on minimums and standards and, and expectations versus personal issues. And what's nice about it is I think too often the only people that get rewarded is the top producer in the office and it almost demotivates everybody else. You know, if I see somebody, you know, struggling to book interviews and all of a sudden they've had, you know, two or three weeks and they're doing their 15 interviews, in fact, they're doing more than 15 interviews and I see that their numbers are improving, I know their production will improve along with it. I'm going to really compliment the results they're getting daily. I'm really going to watch the numbers. And those of you that are not detail-oriented, that are owners and managers, I'm telling you, you can't afford not to be detail-oriented. You've got to watch the numbers. Because otherwise, you know, sales will just get flat and then, then what do you do? Do you lose your business? By setting individual minimum standard results, it becomes easier to clearly express measurable expectations. Most of your people don't even understand what you want them to achieve. I love when owners and managers say to me, you know what, I know my people could produce more. I say, well, what do you expect of them? Well, I expect them to produce. Well, what do you expect them to produce? Well, more than they are. You know, once your sales team understands the result they need to achieve, their income goals, they can focus on attaining those results on a consistent basis because you've given them the tools. It's also important to maintain a positive, motivated attitude in sales because of the high level of rejection and failure. Your people are rejected on a daily basis. Many more people say no to us than say yes. You know, and measuring provides a daily opportunity for instant feedback and gratification. You've got to tell people when they've got a, done a good job. You've got to thank them for their efforts. And always remember, you're in business to make a profit, prosper, and grow, not provide jobs for the people that you employ. Metrics will help you make the necessary and tough decisions you often must make. You know, and I know often we sit there and go, you know, well, this person really isn't making me money, but they're close to a placement. They can be close to a placement for six months, and now you're out, you know, $25,000, $30,000, and they're no closer than they were six months ago. You know, and, and the numbers do help you make the tough decisions that entrepreneurs have to make. So that's our program on metrics. Um, the, I think the most important part of this program right now is that we open these lines for your questions, and you could ask me questions one of two ways. When you called in, you were given a telephone number, an access code, and a PIN number. Um, if you put that final PIN number in, you can find your name on the attendee list, and you'll see a little yellow hand. If you click that little yellow hand, I can unmute your lines, and you and I can talk. Uh, I don't see any hands being raised right now, but I do see some question marks. Um, if you would rather ask me a question, you can go down about three quarters of the way to the control panel and you see the word question. And if you go to that word question, um, it'll open a dialog box. Just type in your questions and I'll be glad to answer any questions. If you don't want me to use your name, I know a lot of times people want to be confidential. If you don't want me to use your name, that's fine. Just put down anonymous, confidential, um, and I'll be, glad to, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Let's see, Barb, you keep cutting off. Is it possible to listen to the presentation again? Um, we have, you know, all of you that are our Tudor or Premier Coaching Club clients, all of these calls are recorded and they're all put into the library. We've got like 300 calls recorded in there. So what we will do is, is we will, you know, we're, it, it takes us about three to five days to get this recording done by our tech team. And then on the home page of your Tudor, you'll see where we're going to download this. So yes. You know, you will have the presentation, you will have the handout, and you'll have the, the recording. It's all posted in the Premier Coaching Club and the Tutor, you know, clients. So we will definitely give you that. Let's see, can you make a suggestion on what software to use for measuring sales and a recruitment staff? It's funny, Atusa. I've looked at everything, and I've looked at a couple things out in the market right now, and they are so expensive that I'm actually trying to develop my own thing internally um, because I'm not finding anything that is simple. I want something that is icon you know, icon focused, and, and it's funny because I have some of my friends that are owners that we've talked about this over and over again about there's just nothing out there that's easy to use, and so I said, I'm going to try to develop something for my own team. If it works, will I maybe consider, you know, rolling it out and making it accessible to others? I might, but I'm not there yet. You know, I'm still beta testing it in my own organization. It just has to be simple, you know, and, and I don't want, you know, I don't want, um, you know, I, I don't want my team bogged down by something that's going to take their time. I want them to focus on the metrics, you know. Let's see, do you display metrics in the office? If so, do you have any examples of this? We don't display the metrics, uh, Joel, but we do, we do display results. 
And so um, we do, we do, you know, have a production board, and I think a production board is really good because you know what productions. But we all have send out hot sheets that we keep on our desk, and everybody know. I mean, the send out hot sheets are on a clipboard because that's where I want my team focused, and so it's the only manual system we use. We use a send out hot sheet, and that's where you put down who you who you're booking on interviews, whether it's temp, contract, direct. We write it down, and we could tell by like going into July, everybody knows they should have had at least one and a half sheets of, of their send out hot sheets filled out. Each send out hot sheet has six six interviews on it, and the reason they should have a sheet and a half is we want them to have nine things going into the next month that are going into second and third interviews. And so we like to have their send out hot sheet, and everybody can see everybody else's. The other thing that's good about that is if your computer system, like we had terrible storms here the last two or three days. In fact, where my home is, I've had no electricity for two days now. And now they're saying it may be days until we're back up because we had a major storm come through Indiana. And so, you know, that's happened in my office before. And you, your system is down. You know, like obviously my wireless at home is down. Luckily, I have an air card that I can work at home on. Um, in my office, we do have power here. But, um, you know, the Santa hot sheet, we've had our lines go down. You know, and I don't care what type of connections you've had. And the center hot sheet lists all the clients, all the candidates, all the phone numbers. And so if somebody's not there, it's also a great tool, you know, for you to use because, you know, you can see all the hot candidates and all the clients and it doesn't shut your business down. Um, you know, it's in, in those of you that own my tutor or Premier Coaching Club, it's in the library. Just click on the icon under my picture that says library and you'll find the center hot sheet in the library. Um, you know, if you can't find it, you know, or you'd like a copy of the Senate Hot Sheet and you can't find it, you can send an email to support at staffingandrecruiting.com and we'll send you a copy of it. So just send a request to support at staffingandrecruiting.com and we'd be glad to send you a copy of this. I know we have some people on the line, I believe, today that might not own the Tudor or Premier Coaching Club, but you've looked at it before. I would still be more than glad to send you that Senate Hot Sheet. So if you want a copy of that, just, um, you know, send us a, an email to support at steppingandrecruiting.com. Um, let's see. You talked about setting five goals. My team has trouble coming up with goals other than production goals because you know what? And I'll tell you what, I had trouble coming up with goals. And the reason I had trouble coming up with goals, Janet, is because, you know, I wasn't thinking. I was always thinking production and money. In fact, the first 15 years of my career, all of my goals were money. And then I finally started thinking, okay, what about, ask them what goals do they have in their personal life, education, philanthropic, spiritual, um, health, you know, what do they want to do? If you start giving them, give them, you know, five or six examples, what's important to you in other areas of your life? It's amazing what, what, what people can come up with, you know, and so I think that, it, you know, again, it, it, really, it really should be what's most important. Each person is going to be different, but if you give them the categories like spiritual, philanthropic, health, personal, then they start thinking about things, wow, you know, I should have some goals in those other areas. You know, and a healthy lifestyle, it seems to be a big one for most people. Um, so those would be examples of, like, non-productive goals. I want to live a healthy lifestyle. You know, I want to get more involved in my church. Um, I would like to give more of my time. I would like to back some worthy cause. You know, I'd like to. So whatever they want to do. Can you share your standards for each metric? That would be hard, Rocky, because I don't do what you do. And I don't have... I don't have specific standards across the board that each person has to hit because I have minimum standards, but I don't have, um, you know, my standards are different for my rookies as opposed to my experienced people, and I only do direct placement and high-level contract, and so my stats would be way off for somebody doing, you know, temp <coughs> or working a blended desk. You know, we're, we're very separated. And I think what you have to do is you have to look at what the current metrics are, Rocky, in your office. Look for what the metrics are of your current people. And then what you want to do once you know your metrics, then look what are the metrics of your better producers. You know, and, and you know, when I, when I first started doing this, I, I tracked everybody's metrics, and then I just got an average metric for our office, taking the top producers in as well as the low producers in. You know, and then I had my average metric. And then, I, then our goal was to lower, you know, we wanted to lower the metrics. We wanted them to have many more hires. You know, we didn't want high metrics, we wanted lower metrics. So once everybody had their metrics, we would show them, okay, now we want to lower them. If they're high, this is what the problem might be. And it just makes managing so much easier. Um, how much gross margin should we expect from a rookie recruiter during their first six months? 
Um, we sell temp clerical accounting and legal services. Um, again, Nick, that's a very tough question to answer because it depends on your geographics. You know, when I was in downtown Chicago, and, and you're going to hate this, this answer, but when I was in downtown Chicago and I first started doing, you know, my business in downtown Chicago, I was listening to a lot of trainers and a lot of speakers on what should the average margin be. And I realized that so many of the firms in Chicago were quoting such low margins. I finally decided this is just crazy. And everybody had a different formula. Like how do you figure out your burden and your gross margin of profit and how do you do this? So what I finally told my team is, you know, whatever the pay rate is, whatever we're, you know, paying the, the, the candidate, the temp, our bill rate has to be double the pay rate plus a dollar. And you can, do, you can negotiate down to double the pay rate. And they looked at me like, are you nuts? So in other words, if the client was paying us $20 an hour, I wanted to be paying the candidate 10 you know, somewhere close to 10 And it was interesting because when I had someone actually look at my clerical business, they were like, your margins are like double what we're getting from the same clients. We didn't do high volume, but we did high margin. I would rather have longer term high margin business than low margin business, Nick. And so you've got to look at your geographic area, you've got to look at what your competitors do, but you've also got to look at what kind of business am I trying to develop here. And what we did in Chicago, we ended up putting a very big emphasis in the legal community. And, and we did a lot with traveling paralegals. And they were great because they'd worked time and a half. Our margins were incredible. And we did a lot with the trademark and, the trademark and patent firms because they were willing to pay more for their secretaries on both the direct side as well as the temporary side than any other law firms where family law paid very low, criminal law paid very low, you know, personal injury paid very low. But it was the firms that were doing the corporate law, you know, that were doing litigation and that were doing trademark and patent. So that became our targets. And so most of our business were to those targets that we could charge a higher margin. So, you know, again, as an owner, and, and your people have to know what is the absolute lowest, you know, markup, I, you know, because you know, you could actually have business and lose money on it. You and I both know that. Most recruiters don't understand that. So they've got to know the, the minimum markup. If you're brand new to tracking metrics as well as your entire team, what are the best metrics to track initially so you can begin to see trends and ratios of conversion? The best, there are two ratios, Lisa. I would track send out to placement or send out to fill, depending on if you're doing direct or temp, and I would do job order, temp assignment, or contract. Uh, to fill. So how many orders are you writing before you fill one? How many people are you sending out on first interviews till, till somebody is hired? And make sure you use our send out hot sheet because that will help you track both of those stats. Do you have industry averages on activities to use to start on activities that you can share in goal setting? It's interesting, Jeff, because years ago, you know, we, we had these because everybody basically had the same type of business model. Now, business models are so all over the place. I've heard that send out to placement ratios right now are hovering right about six to one. So send out to placement, send out to fill is right about six to one. Job order to fill is at the 10 to one rate, which is really high. Um, you know, in some niches it's higher, but if you, you know, just for the, you know, the number of send outs, the number of job orders, it's running roughly six to one and 10 to one, which, you know, the six to one's not bad, but the 10 to one is ridiculous. Um, hi, Barb. I have recruiters that are meeting my minimum placement requirements, but they're not hitting the minimum for their interviews and references. How do you feel about this? Um, I'll tell you what, if they're, if they're making placements, Eric, and they're making me money, um, I'm not going to say too much because they might not be hitting the minimum for interviews, but obviously they don't need to hit your minimum interview numbers. Their ratios are low. They're very good at what they do because they're hitting production goals. So what you're telling me is they're not they're not checking enough references and they're not doing enough interviews, but they're still hitting their production, which means these people probably have ratios that are lower than your minimum standards. And so once you see what their individual ratios are, you might even change your minimum standards for them because they don't have to do it. They're still producing. When I'm going to react is when people are not producing, you know. And the reason people have great month, crappy month, great month, crappy month is because when they're having a great month, they're prepping and debriefing and celebrating and closing. And then when they have you know, then when they have their, you know, the next month, they didn't do the basics. They didn't do recruiting and marketing and presentations, and so the next month is flat. You know, and so I, I would definitely, you know, I would definitely show them that if they did do the interviews and the references, how they might be able to surpass what they're doing right now. But unless they know what's in it for them, unless, unless, and, and again, as an owner or manager, I love that my people have their goals posted by their desk, because if I can help them achieve one of their goals through a contest, believe me, that's the best thing I can do to motivate them.
If I can help somebody attain a goal, I can motivate them. Let's see, does the team share the five goals with the managers? Yes, I, I, want, I want the goals where I can see them. Because as an owner or manager, do you realize sometimes we put contests out there and we demotivate the people that work for us because they don't like the contest? Um, I'll never forget there was an owner, and this was probably two or three years ago, I was at a conference and he came up to me and said, I put $1,500 to $2,000 on the table last month that everybody in my organization had access to that could have won and I didn't even have probably 75% of my team participate. And I said, what was the contest? And for every type of result, like a send out, a job order, you know, he, he was giving out uh, playing cards. And then at the end of the day, they would play a round of Texas Hold'em poker. And then um, at the end of the week, whoever had the winning hand, like the winning hand every day got something, and the winning hand at the end of the week. And he goes, he goes and I said, well, do your people like to play Texas Hold'em? And he goes, we're in Texas. And I said, I understand that, but I lived in Texas for five years, and I don't know how to play Texas Hold'em. And he goes, come on, Barbara. I go, I'm not a card player. Like, I don't know. I, I know how to play Old Maid. I mean, I, I play with my kids. You know, I don't play grown-up card games. And I said, do you have a lot of women that work for you? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, and one of the girls won more than anybody. Like, she loved Texas Hold'em. And I said, okay, so maybe I shouldn't have asked, you know, assume that women don't play cards. But it didn't motivate them. It was too much to track. Remember, we're not detail-oriented. If you give me a contest, give me something fast, give me instant gratification. A lot of times put a $50 bill on the wall and watch what people will do for it. It's crazy. You know, we have to do things that are, that are fast. But if somebody has a goal on that goal sheet and you see they're trying to accomplish something and you give them an individual challenge and say, if you surpass your goals this next quarter by 25% over what you've set, I'm willing to help you get that goal and give them an individual challenge, they'll kill themselves to do it. So the goals help you know how to manage, help you know how to motivate, and plus they need to see them every single minute of the day when they're making calls. The goals have to be posted where they can see them as they talk on their phone. Simple as that. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions. Let me see if anybody else raised their hand getting a budget. Thank you, Nelson. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, let's see here. Hold on a second here. I've got one last question. Is your metric tracking system helping your team? Um, we've been beta testing it for only two months now, and so far so good. Um, I have to beta test it one more month for me to really make that judgment, but yes, because I just have them clicking on icons to track stats, and it's, it's working out pretty well. And again, if I see this as something that works, I may decide to share it. It just, um, this was not something I intended to do, but everybody's asking me about metrics, so I will let you know if, in fact, we do decide to do that. Um, how long would you give a recruiter who is not producing? Um, I don't do it on length of period of time. I don't do it with new hires. I don't do it with experienced people. Um, on a new hire, I'm willing to invest $8,000 before I see money coming back. And so that's in the form of salary, incentive bonuses, whatever. Once I've invested $8,000, if I don't see them producing, if I don't see some really strong you know, um, sales coming in already or they're, they're, they, we're just waiting on cash in, then they're on probation. I think it has to be the same thing for your team members. How much are you willing, willing to lose as an owner? You've got to protect your business. You've got to protect everybody else that works for you. If you keep people that are not making you money, you're jeopardizing everybody in your company. You know, and, and I know the toughest thing is if you had a top producer that's been producing for years and all of a sudden flat, no production. You know, and you want to write it out a month, two months, three months. Now you're in, they're into you for forty or fifty thousand dollars. They may have quit and stayed. So I don't think it's ever about tenure. I don't think it's ever about you know how how long are you going to keep somebody. I think you owe it to them to put them on immediate probation, put them on indefinite probation. Say obviously this isn't working. Let's talk about how we can turn this around. And then you meet with them at the end of every day. You micromanage to try to turn them around. They'll either turn around and appreciate the help, or they'll quit because now they realize you're calling them out and they can't write it out. Most people that quit and stay, stay because you're still paying them. And the other people, by the way, the other people that work for you wonder what's wrong with you. Why are you letting this person stay that's not producing? Like, what the heck? Everybody else is producing, why aren't they? So in a sales organization, you can't have that because it, 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 it really um, has everybody questioning your abilities as a manager or an owner, and you, you can never do that. 
All right, I appreciate all the thank yous. The thank you you can give me, everybody, is to go back and do something with this. Start tracking things. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to the people that work for you. And again, it, it, you're not gonna you're not gonna think that every day is a crapshoot, especially in direct placement. So many people think that you can't predict production when, in essence, you can. You can pr you can predict your production. You can know what results you need every day to consistently hit or surpass goals. So thanks for joining me, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Fourth of July. Um, holiday this uh, weekend in the United States. I hope that you have a wonderful Independence Day in Canada and whatever else you're celebrating in the other countries that are on this line. Um, so enjoy the holiday weekend and come back refreshed and ready to have a record third and fourth quarter. Have a great day everybody. Thanks.